Good morning, Boston City Blessing Church. How are you? Good? Okay. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, for me, this is the third week uh, for me in a row to uh, be here to share uh, the message um, with all of you. And uh, next week, uh, Pastor Z will be here again and then uh, take turn. Tomorrow, I will, um, I will be going to uh, Indonesia uh, for another three weeks. So, Pastor Z will cover me in Rochester. But I'm so excited uh, to share uh, this message for, uh, to all of you this morning. As you know, in the past few weeks, we've been uh, learning about uh, one anothering. And then we learned that God commanded us actually to um, do something to one another as the body of Christ. Which we started from um, to love one another and then to forgive one another and then to serve one another. And then today, I would like to share with you another one another. <laughs> another one another, which is um, encourage one another. And then it won't stop right here. And then next week, we'll still learn about um, one anothering. And then I can see uh, it is uh, so beautiful. It will be so powerful if the church, the body of Christ can really live and practice in these uh, principles, with this, uh, which is uh, one anothering. So, um, let me start. Um, the key verse for today are taken from um, is taken from the book of First Thessalonians, chapter five, verse eleven. I will be uh, reading um, mostly from um, ESV, uh, English Standard uh, Version, otherwise noted. Uh, so, um, most of the verses taken from um, English Standard uh, Version. So the Bible says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Just as you are doing. Now, um, let's get to the basic, this, uh, the, the understanding and the meaning of the word encouragement in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it means number one is to comfort, to cheer us, to counsel, to speak in a friendly manner. But it's not just um, stop right, right there. The meaning of the word encouragement in the, in the New Testament is the act of building. The act of uh, building up, edifying, and then edification. Now, uh, if you can see, you know, I like this term that the Bible used uh, for encouragement is building. Which is for you to build someone else. Someone else. And we know this word building or to build is used uh, often in the, uh, in in um, architecture. It is an architectural uh, architectural uh, term. Now, when you build something, you will go through a process. And then, when you build a house, for example, you'll go to a process, and then you put um, well. I want to give you an example. Uh, basically, you put the bricks by bricks, uh, layer by layer, and then for encouragement, it's like uh, building a, a building, building a house. You build, you put word by word, action by action. It is the act of uh, to promote another's growth in Christian wisdom, in Christian happiness, holiness. Is the act of building a person towards the likeness and the maturity and the character of Jesus Christ. So that's the understanding of the word um, encouragement. So church, the ministry of encouragement can actually be looked like that you are standing with one another and then lifting up one another, lifting up one soul or spirit and bringing a life-giving life uh, presence the presence of God, the power of God, the hope of God the, um, from, uh, for one another. So that encouragement. So encouragement is not like something that you, when you meet someone Sunday morning on the parking lot and then you just say, hi, how are you? Good, good. Oh, good, good for you. So it is, uh, there, there is the power of God that flows from, uh, from, uh, from our mouth and it gives life to the person or the person that we encourage. So... Now let us see, the, I want to invite you to see the um, background of the church in Thessalonica uh, for the Thessalonians. Now in this letter, actually Paul uh, wrote the letter to the people in um, Thessalonica. And then Paul urged them again and again and again to encourage one another. It is very interesting if you can see. Uh, next slide. Yeah, okay. Um, if you can see that Paul encourages the Thessalonians three times. And you know when it is repeated, it means a lot. 
and we can see um, it gives us an understanding that something serious happened. Something serious happened within the church. So Paul needs to urge them again and again to encourage one another. It seems like one is not enough that he needed to wrote uh, the letter and then um, purposefully, specifically put encourage one another three times in his letter. So in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And in 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. And then continue 5.14, And we urge you, Paul and Silas, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint at heart, help the weak, be patient with them all. Now, again, if we look at the history of Thessalonica, when Paul and Silas preached the gospel, many of the people believed in this word, in God's word. And they um, take part, they give themselves, they join the church. But there were some other people, some other group of people that were jealous and they were the bad guy. If you see in different translations, um, it says um, um, it's, it's a bad people from, uh, from the market. It is uh, the troublemakers. So they gather a group of people from the street to attack the church and then to, to start a riot even in the city, to start a chaos in the city. And, you know, this is a very familiar situation. If you know, in Indonesia, it happened a lot of times. Where, uh, people will attack uh, the church, uh, literally, and just maybe, uh, well, throw stones or even burn the building. So it's, the condition is... Um, Kind of uh, like that. So um, we can see that the church was persecuted. The people were hated and threatened because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They were under pressure and they lived with fear. You know, uh, back then I uh, experienced myself that um, not, um, not uh, people trying to uh, burn the place. But when I was uh, joining, um, you know, the uh, small group. Um, well, people just uh, throw small rocks, things like that, or they make uh, sound back then, maybe 20 years ago. But it still happened in Indonesia a lot of times, especially maybe in the rural um, areas, that some people, some um, believers, some uh, Christians still experience this. So you can imagine the condition at that time. And then finally, why, the reason why, why Paul wrote his letters and then encouraged the church to encourage one another. Now, um, I like Pastor Chuck Swindle says, that, says this, every time we encourage someone, we give them a transfusion of courage. Well, every time we encourage someone, we give them a transfusion of courage. So when we encourage someone, it's like you are injecting another blood, a power and then give them courage so they can continue to live their life and then they can continue in this case to look at uh, God himself and his purpose and his calling and then continue to, to fulfill that, that, that calling. So encouragement plays a really important role in the lives of believers. Sometimes we think it's just a simple thing. It does not really matter. And then it's often uh, forgotten. And then it's um, often missed in the church uh, today. So let's see, how did Paul encourage the Thessalonians? The way Paul encourages the Thessalonians. It is interesting. It says like this. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted one, um, each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in the manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Now, this is Paul's encouragement to the Thessalonians. Paul exhorted the Thessalonians um, to encourage one another. But not only exhortation and encouragement, Paul also gave an example, set an example and guided them with the practical action they, that they needed to take, which is, well, I charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God. So we might think that encouragement is merely just a good and positive words like, you know, uh, when we say to someone, well, you know, um, everything's going to be all right. It's okay. Everything's going to be all right. Even there's a song for that. And just, you, just, you just think positive. You know, be strong. Just do your best. I know you can do it, man. Come on. It's okay. It will pass. 
this two shall pass. It will pass. It will, uh, we will experience. There is still another um, sunlight tomorrow morning. Be encouraged. But you know, notice that Paul didn't just uh, say those words, those kind of words, but Paul go beyond those words. And then um, rather than saying those words, Paul charged them. Walk in the manner worthy of God. With their condition, the church condition that they live uh, with fear, Paul said that, come on, walk in the manner worthy of God. Who is God? The God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul even reminded them the calling of God, the purpose of God in their life. Now, the goal of encouragement should be more than just reaching the mind and the soul, but it needs to reach the spirit of a person to bring people to realize who we are in God, who our God is, who is the God that accompanies us, that's with us, and what God has given us. It talks about identity, if you still remember, that power comes from knowing your identity. If you know that God is with you, then we can walk confidently. The power of God is with you. The anointing of God is with you. God is Emmanuel. He will never leave us alone. So He is with us. Now I want to invite you to see these um, three conditions in the church that Paul shared in his letter and then learn on how can we uh, encourage one another. And then this is also um, the condition of the church today. Many, many people ex experience these kind of uh, um, conditions. So number one, uh, um, Paul encouraged us to comfort the brokenhearted. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible says, Paul wrote, But we do not want you to be ununiformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who died, those who were persecuted, that you may not grieve as others to who, uh, to grieve as others, who do not have hope, you know. Um, so when we grieve, there is hope still in Jesus Christ. Now at that time, the Thessalonians were wondering why many of our fellow believers um, had died and what would happen with them um, when Christ returned. They were kind of weary. You know? They were weary. And uh, um, they were afraid also as if that those who died before Christ returned would never see him again. And then for them, it even made them grieve even more. And the grief had become more unbearable for, for some of them. Now here, Paul wanted the Thessalonians to understand that that is not the end of the story. Because Jesus Christ came back to life, so will all believers, including those who have already died. In our life today, Many of us felt her heart broken. We grieved over something. We grieved over something. Now, you know, when we hear the word grief, um, our mind uh, connects with um, someone, uh, a person that we love so much, and then um, those person, this person just uh, left us. You know, uh, they died, they um, passed away. Um, we often think about, well, grieving is losing people, basically like that. It is a significant, significant part of loss, but it is not the only kind of a loss. No. There are different kind of losses, losses um, that breaks our heart, hurt our feelings, creates a disappointment, and often a wound, a scar in our heart that can last for quite a long, long time and bring a variety of feelings. Some, of, uh, some are sudden and then unexpected, while others are, you can see it, uh, it coming. You know, we lose things daily and grieve um, those losses no matter how big or small they are. You know, it's not just losing a person, but it can be the death of uh, an expectation. You have an expectation, but well, it died because of so many things. And maybe... It's a loss of dream. You lost your dream when our dreams, our plans, our hopes are unrealized the way we want it or even doesn't even happen. We grieve. 
And then loss of a season. Loss of a season. Wishing that we can work, we can, we can turn back time. Wishing that our children were still young. Wishing that our parents will, were healthier. Wishing that uh, I can be, uh, again, go back to five years ago, maybe ten years ago, so I can do better for my parents maybe, for my family, or for my, for my children. But, oh, well, unfortunately, this is life. It's always moving forward even we don't want it to. Life goes on. The show must go on. And then we lost those kind of seasons in our lives. And um, it brings us um, into a disappointment that we want to go back there, but then we lost it. We will never be able to, well, to go back, to turn um, the time back again. Or maybe grief can come from loss of relationship. Either with your parents, with your uh, friends, someone that's uh, dear to you, then you grieve. You can feel that disappointment, the scar in your heart. And then sometimes it's just, um, it's hard. Um, some people try to find things to get busy doing some things or don't. maybe go here and there, make them busy doing things, going here and there to, you know, just to forget maybe. But it's because of that loss. You grieve in your heart because of that loss. And then maybe... Also, it can be like maybe a loss of an idea and et cetera, et cetera. It makes, um, it can usher you into maybe an extreme sadness. Now, let's see this. Those experiences ushers us into an extreme disappointment and sadness. And grief settles over, grief settles in our heart. That's why in, 1 Thessalonians 4, next verse, uh, after verse 13, in verse, in verse 14, Paul wrote this, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, though through Jesus, God will bring with him, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, um, if you read the whole chapter, you can uh, understand. So first, the Thessalonians, some of them um, was grieving because they lost their loved ones because of the persecution. Now let's see this. There is life in Jesus Christ. There is life in Jesus Christ. And don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Just keep the faith. And then, then even in verse 18 from the, chap the same uh, chapter, Paul wrote again, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What's the point? What's the point from Paul's um, um, letter, from uh, these verses? As Paul comforted the Thessalonians with the promise of the resurrection, you know, Paul wants us also to comfort each other and let us encourage one another and reassure that each other, re let's reassure each other with hope from God, from Jesus Christ, that Jesus rose from the dead. And then there is hope in Jesus Christ. That's the message. Well, you know, when you grieve, Paul mentioned, grieve like those who do not have hope. We as believers, we as Christians, we have hope in Jesus Christ. Because Christ rose from the dead and He will come again. He will come again into our life. So church, we don't need to despair when our loved one dies, or maybe world events take a tragic turn, because I believe that God will turn, God can turn tragedy into triumph, poverty maybe to riches, pain to glory, and even defeat to victory. All believers throughout the history will stand reunited in God's very presence, safe, safe and secure. And it is our part as the body of Christ to encourage one another to bring hope into people's life by the way of our words of encouragement. So number two, continue. We need to light up the fire. Light up the fire in your fellow Christians or believers. While there were people who experienced grief and need encouragement, Others, other people in Thessalonians church made the return of Christ as an excuse for idleness in the meantime. This is very interesting. 
they had an excuse to just um, sit down and chill, bro. Uh, just relax. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 11, Bible says, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. They were busy. But you know what Paul meant, this is the issue. The issue here is not problems, it's not uh, challenges, it's not adversities in life, it's not fear. But this is about the spiritual idleness, the spiritual sleepiness. And for some people in the church, they have fallen into a spiritual state uh, where they have lost their passion, their enthusiasm, their fire in God. For example, building the relationship with God, reading the Word, praying to God, serving God, and working for God to be involved in the ministry, for example. They just become idle and then um, um, just mundane, just do routine, and then just, you know, just do what, whatever they can do. But, you know, we have a bill to pay, just go back to work tomorrow morning again after long weekend, 4th of July. Oh, come on. Uh, end of the day. Last uh, 4th of July on Monday, um, I went to, with my family, we went to uh, Dover to our, one of our members, um, um, Hope. And then house, so we watch the you know uh, the fireworks, and then after that it's done. Uh, everything, the um, the loudness, um, the all the amazing fireworks, and okay, it's done, it's finished, already nine or ten, almost ten. Let's go home, let's go back to work. Tomorrow go back to work again. Start the week again. So it's just like that. For them, it's just this. They're they're just uh, busy bodies, busy bodies doing things. Doing uh, the routine. And maybe also in the church, we can get trapped into this kind of routine where we just, um, you know, we can mm, involve in the ministry, but we have lost our passion. We have lost our enthusiasm. We have lost, um, you, know, um, you know, the eagerness in our heart to, to, to give the best. The, you know, the, the, those kind of, of feelings. We become, you know, sleepy in our spiritual um, being. Now, thank God for salvation. Christ is coming. And, you know, people may think that, oh, thank God, salvation. I have secured my place in heaven next, in the other life. So, why should I be so passionate about, for example, again, reading the words of God or praying or to be involved in the ministry? Now, let's see how does Paul encourage them? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 to um, 10. I will read the full um, um, verses. The Bible says this. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Now, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and... For a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us, destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Now, while Paul's encouragement was given to strengthen those who were grieving, it is also given to light up the fire. You know, to those who were spiritually sleeping and uh, sleepy, those who are sleepy and sleeping, strap your blessed plate, put on your helmet, arm yourself, always be ready for battle. You cannot be just idle. You cannot be in the, in the, in the idle uh, state. You know, Satan is so cunning. If we want to be part of the kingdom of God, we need to stay awake and stay alert because otherwise our faith can be drifted Without we realize, um, you know, Satan is so cunning, ideas, today's ideas can intercept into our mind and then it can drift us away from the calling of God. We started to agree with, you know, what people think about this and that instead of the words of God, which is the solid truth, the word of the living God. Now, in the next verse, Paul said, this is verse uh, 6 to 10. And then verse 11, Paul said this, Therefore, 
encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So church, it is our responsibility as the body of Christ to remind each other, to encourage each other, to remind each other again how serious the spiritual armies that are lined up against us and ready, ready to take us down. So let's awaken one another. If you see that your brothers or sisters, they're sleepy or they're sleeping even in their spiritual state, now it is our part to light up another's fire, passion, enthusiasm, and build one another. So let us encourage one another. It is our part. It is our responsibility. Sometimes, well, as long as I live okay, as I do my ministry, um, I do my part, God, in the church, well, that's good enough. And that's enough. I don't care about other people. Well, actually, it is our responsibility to encourage one another. And the same thing. I, I, I um, mentioned to uh, one time um, in uh, Rochester, you know, I need all of you. How can I know if I am wrong, if someone didn't tell me? So if I did a mistake, I got wrong, please tell me. Please tell me, I need you. I don't want to become like a leader that, pastor that, oh, everything's all right. Pastor has the most, the right thing to say. Well, my words can be wrong. I'm still human. Please let me know. That way I can get better. I can um, be a better person, be a better pastor, be a better le leader. So as I need you, we all need each other. So let's encourage one another. It is very important that you are here. You're, you have an important role in your brother's um, growth um, in their maturity in Christ. So number three, the last one. We need to strengthen the faint-hearted or the weak. First Thessalonians 5 verse 14 once again, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Now here, Paul addressed the Thessalonians who had grown weary under the weight of life. And the word faint-hearted appears only once in the New Testament, just a knowledge, but it does appear several times in the Greek translation in the Old Testament. And then look at this. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 14, the Bible says, they will, uh, The will to live sustains you when you are sick. But depression crushes courage and leaves you unable to cope. That's um, very practical and uh, it's true. And um, in English Standard Version say that a crushed spirit who can bear. You know, when we got disappointed, hearted, we are weak in our soul, in our spirit. Well, as if that nothing that we can do. A cross spirit, who can bear? Well, if it is just our physical body, we can, um, you know, recover um, soon. Maybe just um, do some physical things, exercise again. But as the Bible says, depression crushes, crushes courage. And when you, when you don't have courage, well, it's hard to move forward. It is hard to continue. And it leaves you unable to cope. So, church, I want to say this to you. Some of you might be in this, state, in this state today where it seems like you are crushed in your spirit. Maybe it feels like your hearts are weighed down by, 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 by life. It's my life. Well, I want to remind you the kindness and the compassion of our God for us. Isaiah 57 verse 15, New Living Translations. The Bible says, The high and lofty one who lives in eternity. The holy one, God himself says this, I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits and are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentance hearts. 
So God promised us that, you know, the God, the, our most high God who lives in the high, holy, lives in heaven in eternity, He draw near to the faint-hearted to revive them, to give them strength. The Almighty God and the powerful God and yet so tender, so above and yet so near, so holy and yet so compassionate. You know, God will draw to us as we draw ourselves to Him. So this morning, some of us might suffer from sorrow of grief. Some might have lost their hope because of the loss of um, one and another, your family member maybe. Some of us might be in the condition where you have lost your passion, your enthusiasm for God and became idle. I'm still, I cannot just, uh, you know, move on from uh, this thing, from this disappointment, from this grief. Avoiding, finally, uh, you are avoiding and walking away from the calling of God in your life. You've been doing great things, but you stop at one point because of disappointment. Or you might be in the condition that you feel like, oh, life is so hard. It weighed me down. My burden is so heavy. Living just barely above the water. It's so hard. Well, I want, you, I want to invite you this morning to get connected with the body of Christ. Get connected, be planted in the church and, you know, join our care cell if you haven't already because that's the place where the body of Christ, brothers and sisters um, are there for you, where the encouragements um, are there. And then we, get, we, we are reminded this morning that our part, it is very important that our presence in the church at Carcel, for example, and even in general, we are the body of Christ. We need someone else and we are there for another. You know, if we see again, each part of the body did not serve its own, but it served another part of the body. We are here. Let's be sensitive. I pray that the church will be sensitive again to see um, if one, um, uh, some of us or one of us, they're, they're ex ex experiencing those kind of things. And that's our part. That's why we are here. And we can see it is very important for the church to be involved in this ministry. And it doesn't take, um, you know, um, things to do this. We just need to get connected with God and say the words of God, the words of the living God that can give them power, strengthen, strengthen their life, and give them passion again so they can continue to move on. Now, church, remember that you are not alone. You are not alone. We are here for you. God is available for you. So with this, as God commanded us to encourage one another, let us encourage one another. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. And I want to invite you to uh, stand with me as we close our service this morning. Yes, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you, God, for your words. I pray that the words, the living words, the powerful words of God, will strengthen your people, will encourage your people. Bring us back, O oh God, to you. Draw us closer to you, O oh God. As we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And I believe there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that the church will continue to grow and will continue to live for one another, to encourage one another, to forgive one another, to love one another and to serve one another. Lord, I pray this morning that uh, the church will be the doer of the words of God, not just the hearer of the words of God. And the church will continue to grow stronger and stronger and stronger and will become a blessing to so many people. There is life in this church, in the house of God. Thank you, Father God. I seal these words in Jesus' name. 
you may lift up your hands and let's receive the blessings of God. Beloved in the Lord, go home with peace and know that the Holy Spirit is with you. God Himself is with you from now until forever. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you His favor and give you His peace. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Happy Sunday.